This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund. Thanks very much for joining us. And here's a book that we should have got to hear rather some time ago. It is history, it is mystery, it's romance, and regret, and the land, and longing, and race, and maybe reconciliation. It is Camp Nine. And its author joins us, Vivian Schiffer. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Steve, for having me. I appreciate it. This, you are a daughter of Deshea County. I am, absolutely. And ventured into the law where you spent 30 years doing M&A work. That's correct. Uh, in an adopted state of Texas. Yes. But a bit of your heart obviously was still here. Sense of Rather place. Rather a lot of it. It absolutely is. Sense of place is, is very central to who I am and who I think a lot of people are. Um, and I feel fortunate that I was able to grow up in a place that has such a strong cultural um, draw to it. The, the Delta, that's what the story is about. And one of the best um, comments I got from a reviewer all the way in Australia that really surprised me was she said that when she read Camp Nine, she, could, she really felt the place. And I was so happy and grateful that that came across. What, well, let's, <laughs> we're getting ahead of ourselves. What in the book is Camp Nine? Camp Nine is, a, is the fictional, fictional version of the Roar incarceration camp, and that was one of ten uh, War Relocation Authority relocation camps, as they called them at the time, but they were um, more commonly known now as incarceration camps. In the case of um, the Roar camp, there were at its peak 8,500 Americans of Japanese ancestry there between the war between the war years of 1942 and 1945. So these were. Um, 98% of the Japanese American population in the United States in 1942 were removed from their homes and sent to prisons in the interior. And there were 10 camps. Um, a lot of people don't realize, people who are even otherwise well informed on the subject, don't realize that two of those camps were in Arkansas. But they, they were. one of Jerome, right? That's right. Uh, Roar was in Deshea County, and Jerome is. Interestingly enough, part of the camp was in Chico County and the hospital was in Drew County. So uh, th those were the Arkansas camps. What put you to the typewriter? Or to the keyboard, I should say. You, you know, um, I, I was practicing law and happily doing so, but I'm a really creative and artistic person and it wasn't quite enough. So I had written a couple of books that, um, that did not sell because they frankly weren't very good. and. Um, I took a screenwriting course at UCLA Film School, and in the course of that, I was speaking with one of my instructors. Uh, she mentioned uh, she had a very big interest in the Japanese American incarceration experience, and I just I told her I said, "Well, you know, I have a strong family connection to that. Roar is my hometown. Roar being one of the ten camps." So I told her about my family's history with the camp, and um, in, in later years with preservation efforts and within the Japanese American community and she said you've got to write that story so I actually she said you have to make that movie and I wasn't ready to do that I felt much more comfortable writing a novel so I started working on it and you know the elements of my family history are in the book uh, it, it, well, that was my next question <laughs> yeah it's it's not about my family it's a completely fictionalized but once you start writing about something that is so near to you and so well known by you, in this case, the sense of place, I don't think you can really fully develop that without drawing on your own personal experiences. And there's, not a, there's only one person in this book that was a real person. It's the shopkeeper. Everybody else is an amalgamation of people I've known uh, in my life. <coughs> About that sense of place, can I, do you mind if I whet the reader's appetite or the viewer's uh, appetite? Please do. I won't violate comfort here. To our guests, the South is, or at least the Arkansas Delta, uh, is a place where summer 
is a custom rather than a season. Summer is molasses, a place where there were never any emergencies that required any hurry. Uh, the land was power and those with it controlled those without it, pure and simple. Many of the people fatigued by their own insecurity and the upper classes were sometimes, the upper classes were possessed of a gentility conjured up from thin air. I resent a lawyer <laughs> writing on it beautifully. Thank you. I mean, you had me there, and uh, you know, I can smell the cotton poison as it wafts oh, over the fields. Isn't there, that right? one of the most unique Delta sensory experiences? Is the smell of cotton poison, and and trying to describe that to somebody who's never experienced that. Um, it, it, it was a challenge. It was a challenge that I really wanted to embrace and I enjoyed it. I really did. I really enjoyed going back to that place in my head because I wrote this book entirely away from Arkansas. I don't think I wrote any sentences in the state of Arkansas. Um, and another thing is that my mother, who's a, um, who was a child of the 1930s and 1940s, when she read it, she said, how did you know what life was like out there in the 1930s and 40s? I said, because that's the way it was in the 60s when I was growing up there. It really had not changed that much. Time had not reached to Shea County, at least that small pocket. Well, at another point in the text, you have one of your characters remark, uh, as, she, as her daughter is contemplating, uh, you know, the gates of, of, uh, of, of, or of, the, of, the camp, of Camp Nine, mm -hmm. she says, Mom, this is a prison. I mean, this isn't a camp, it's a prison. And her mom replies, the Delta is a prison. Right. I think that places like the Delta that are so economically depressed and so geographically isolated, and I think that's one of the reasons why those counties have so much economic difficulty is because of their geographic isolation. You know, the Mississippi River is right here. And there's one way into the delta, and there's one way out. There's very little crossing of that river. There's a crossing at Helena. There's a crossing at, at Greenville. There's one at Memphis. Um, it's really difficult to get, at least in those days, it was very difficult to travel in and out. Now, of course, people in the delta have the internet, and they have cell phones, sure. and they live just like everybody else does. But I think particularly in times when transportation and communication were not as available as they are now. Uh, it was really hard for people to escape and there was so much poverty. There really was. I think it was really hard for people to escape their surroundings and their circumstances and they had to make do, I believe. If there's one thing that I, I did notice in the book, there is um, a kind of existential, I don't want to say dread, hanging over the landscape, but it, it's there sort of like that purple haze that you can see in the Arkansas right. Delta if you're there in the autumn anyway. That's one of the things that intrigues me about the Delta, is a, a history and a sense of violence and doom. I mean, I tell my friends who are not from Arkansas, who don't understand the geography, there's a reason the blues came from the Mississippi Delta. There is a history of violence, and I talk about it in the book, you know, mm -hmm. with, the, with the Uncle Willie character and the Levy Camp and the Levy Camp Hollers. That was a dangerous, dangerous place. Um, even we were talking earlier with someone who had family in Watson, which is also in Deshaie County. The tales of violence in Watson at the turn of the last century are legendary. I mean, it was, it was wilderness and it was very, very dangerous. And with the river there too, you know, people would get on and off boats and, and then disappear again. So and I think that kind of stays with the region. And 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 less well as you know it's now a, a cyber region like the rest of the country. Right. I mean in in Deshea County or Green or Mississippi or Lee or wherever counties, there's the internet and everybody's got a cell phone and still it's the Delta. Right, it's one of those um, beautiful cultural spots that I hope will never change. I hope the economic prospects get better. I hope the infrastructure gets better. I hope the educational systems get better. But I hope it never loses that special something that makes it so culturally significant. And that is what, what fascinated me about putting Japanese Americans 
in that place at a time when it wasn't open. It wasn't. It, there was no internet. There was no transportation. It was even no interstates. There was no, no interstate. Yeah. There, even even the road. Hi, I think Highway One at the time. I may be mistaken about this, but I think Highway One wasn't even paved. Arkansas State Highway One out to the camp wasn't even paved. So. You take these people, in many cases they were professionals from Los Angeles, Sacramento, um, many of them were farmers, but these were educated and cultured people and to bring them and put them there in this place of wildness and danger, um, that just fascinated me. I just, I had to know more about it. How'd you go about doing that? Well, um, my mother is Rosalie Gould. Uh, she was for 12 years the mayor of McGee, Arkansas. McGee is the town nearest Roar. It's 11 miles away. And when she first became mayor, she was approached, this was in the early 80s, she was approached by a group of Japanese Americans who were coming, who were returning to the Roar camp to place a monument. Now, what your viewers may not understand or appreciate is that Roar is really unique of the 10 war relocation camps. Roar is the only one to, f to have what it has, which is a magnificent cemetery. And it's not just a cemetery with a couple of headstones in it. This is a cemetery that has 24 headstones, and it has two beautiful, beautiful monuments that were built by hand by the prisoners while they were there. One of them is a monument to the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Team, which to this day remains the most decor highly decorated unit in American military history. It was a segregated Japanese-American fighting unit during World War II. And then the other monument is, a, um, is just a monument to the people who are buried in the cemetery mm -hmm. and to the people who were imprisoned at Roar. But um, so that is unique among the 10 camps. No other camps have this. So these people were returning in early 80s, and they wanted to place another monument there at the cemetery. Um, and they sought my mother's assistance. That she, she basically was going to host them to a dinner. Uh, and that was the first time she'd really learned anything about what had happened at Roar. Even though we had lived there and we saw the monuments, we had kind of an understanding of what had happened. Nobody ever talked about it. It wasn't that it was a grave secret. It just wasn't a topic of conversation. So when, she, when these people approached her and she learned what had happened out at that site, uh, she became really interested in it. And um, she said that she would help take care of the site. So as people, more and more interest in returning to the Roar camp from the people who had been imprisoned there, uh, as that interest grew, they naturally sought her out to take them out there. And many of these people have described being afraid to return they didn't know what kind of reaction they were going to get. So I think she helped be a buffer, a safe place for them to start. And, um, and so as she became friends with them, more and more people came. It finally got to the point where tour buses would come to see her. And uh, there was a tour company in Los Angeles that booked tours to see Rosalie Gould. People would get on planes in Los Angeles and they would fly to Little Rock, they'd get on buses, and they'd make a pilgrimage down to McGee and then out to Roar. So I, my mother is a widow and she was alone and she would like a companion to help her greet these people. So to the extent that I could, because my children were little and I had some flexibility, um, I would meet them with her and I heard their stories and learned what had happened to them all those years ago. Are you satisfied that now we have uh that, that its place in, in Arkansas history, and for that matter, U.S. history, is firm, secure. <clears throat> the artifacts themselves, the camp itself, is now absolutely um, being tended well. Part of the problem when these folks came was that the cemetery was in terrible disrepair. Uh, there was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful man who lived in Little Rock, North Little Rock, I believe, named Sam Yada. And Mr. Yada, uh, his family, they were the only ones, the only Japanese Americans who left the Roar camp and settled permanently in Arkansas. Interestingly enough, there were seven or eight families who were afraid to return to California. Um, they, the violence in California yeah. against them was so great that they were afraid to return. Um, so they decided to stay in Arkansas, and they ended up sharecropping in Scott, just outside Little Rock. And they eventually all returned except for the Yada family. So 
those families would come once a year. They drive down from Scott, and in the 1940s and 1950s, that was not an easy drive. That was an all-day affair. They would pile into a pickup truck, and they would drive to Roar, and they would clean up the cemetery. And this went on for years and years. And so that monument they wanted to dedicate was to Mr. Yada. Why did you choose fiction over history? W with, a, with the notion that, or with the, granted, that a lot of historians believe the best history is written in fiction, and as opposed to, quote, nonfiction. But you chose a fictional structure model. I did. Uh, there are many fine books, many fine scholarly books written by people like Greg Robinson and Roger Daniels on the incarceration experience. Um, but they don't, and they, they allow people to understand what happened, which is always important for people to know facts and to understand. But I wanted people to feel what happened. And I think you can really only do that by allowing a reader to become somebody else and to really put themselves into the place of another character who lives in another time in another place and have those experiences. I think that's the only way they can really, they can really feel these experiences. Mm -hmm. And an adolescent girl was, the, was your vehicle. She was. I, she didn't start off that way. In fact, she started off younger. Um, and she started off, I was, I was reticent to tell this story because I felt it was a story that had happened to other people, and I wasn't one of those people. So I didn't want to presume to speak for the Japanese-American community, and I didn't want to presume to speak for the African-American community. So this little girl was originally only going to comment on what she saw. I wrote it like that, where she would, and I would allow the reader to draw their own conclusion. But as I got into it, I just decided that that wasn't rich enough, that she really could comment. And, it, it, and even still, I, I didn't put myself into, I didn't presume to speak for the Japanese American community or the African American community. She's still only reporting on what she sees. She's a pretty reliable narrator. I think so, yeah. She's, she sees a lot. And there was, and there was a lot going on during that time, mm. that if, if a person was observant enough, there, was a, there would be a lot of irony and a lot of drama to see. Here's, here's, here's another of your characters at another point. Uh, it's the adolescent girl, our narrator's grandfather. Yes. If you, addressing his granddaughter, if you stop to think about what's fair, the Delta will pass you flat by. Flat by. Yeah. His perspective, he was an interesting character to write. Um, <laughs> And I enjoyed working with him. They were all interesting. They Walter were... Morton was fun to write. Yeah. There were a lot of people that profiteered during the war years, or people that profiteer all the time. And I find those people fascinating. I, it, it seems that they have no sense of uh, morality or what's right. But I didn't want that to be so for Walter Morton. Walter Morton is a realist. He has, gained, he has garnered his wealth in a cat fight of a situation to get where he was in the Delta and he's going to hang on to it but he, he has these moments of, of civility and I of course won't give away the ending which you know Let's she, not do that. she learns when he really um, you know did the right thing even though it was highly illegal um, but but I wanted to inject some realism in that book I didn't want it to just be kind of pie in the sky everybody's um, you know, downtrodden and being taken advantage of, and isn't it terrible? I wanted to put a human side on the on the people who did build that structure. Is that structure in need of update? Well, we've kind of talked about that. Well, I tell you, I feel that I was fortunate to live, to be born in a time that I feel was the end of an era. And I'm so glad that era is over because it was a terrible era, but it was still an interesting era because it was right before the Civil Rights Movement. And so I can clearly remember the racial distinctions. I mean, really, really strongly remember them in, in a way that I think people being born today can only read about. I know there's still so much disparity, so much racial disparity and so much class disparity. 
But when I was growing up, as a young child, it was the law. It wasn't just custom, and it wasn't just a social uh, conv conviction. It was actually the law. De jure. And I think that um, it's already changed. I mean, the kind of world that Walter Morton was trying to hang on to has already changed. Um, still, we have crooked politicians. Still, we have people who steal, wealthy people who steal from poor people. But there's so much more scrutiny because of communication, I think. Uh, I think people are held up to more scrutiny. They can't get away with the kinds of things that Walter Morton would have been able to get away with. You dedicated the book to uh, the infant of Prague. Yes. Why? I just made a pilgrimage to Prague two weeks ago, as a matter of fact. Uh, the infant of Prague is my patron saint. Uh, he has done some great things for me, and when I need him, he's always there. My brother is a Catholic priest, and he introduced me to this very special icon. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to honor the infant of Prague by dedicating the book to him. Yeah. There was, uh, and that's part of the country, of, of the state anywhere, where there was a substantial Catholic population. Yes. Of, you know, for, owing to the German, w wave of German immigrants back there who were some Catholic, some Protestant. But and don't forget about the Italians. About? About the Italians. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the Italians populated Chico County because of the Sunnyside Plantation. A few Mazzanis still down there, I believe. I, I'm related to the Mazzanis. Uh, my mother was a Santini. Hmm? Her mother was a Floriani. And uh, I was born in the Lake Village Hospital. Yeah. And it, but it does have a, a big Catholic population, and I think that the Delta itself has an inordinately large um, Catholic population that would surprise people. But that planter class... What we call Stuttgart was started as Stuttgart. But that's right. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. But that planter class that lived along the, um, the Mississippi River, right. there weren't terribly many of them, but they tended to at least have their children educated um, in convent schools. My grandmother and her sisters were sent away to a convent school for education, and I believe that's how they became Catholics. That's how my mother and father met, actually, is that my father, uh, who was a, or what you would think of as a very waspy uh, son of a plantation owner, uh, married this little Italian girl they met in church. Uh-huh. There is this romance, as you suggested a moment ago, the sense of romance uh, th that hangs over the Delta to this day, despite its problems, despite the disparities, social, cultural, economic, legal, whatever. It's still there. I mean, breathe it, you go over there. Right. Inhale it. But, golly, it's beautiful on so many levels. I've brought people, because of the documentary I'm making, um, I brought my film crew to the Delta, to, and we do a lot of locale shooting. Uh, a lot of cypress swamps, and every time I bring somebody from out of town to the levee, <laughs> it's, that. it's, you can't, I mean, I tried to describe the levee in Camp 9, and I think I did a pretty good job, but until you're there and you're standing in front of that massive earthwork in the middle of nowhere, and you, and you smell that milkweed, and you hear the cicadas, and you, you can see the herons flying in among those giant trees, and it, it's just, as I, in my opinion, and I put it in Camp Nine, because I'm the author, I get to say what I want, is that that region is defined by that levee. It is the most iconic thing out there. It's, yeah. it's found nowhere else. It's ours. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even on Facebook, I see friends of mine who are, you know, grew up in the McGee area, right, you know, was riding on the levee last night, and we're all just sort of, ah, oh, <laughs> I wish we could be there. Yeah. So, the, the film that's going to come on yeah. the same subject, you're at work on that. It's, the backdrop is the same subject, but it actually turned into a, a more modern day story. I was surprised. I, when I started making the film, well, so to continue the story of my mother, Rosalie Gould, in the course of her uh, interacting with and becoming really much beloved by the Japanese American community, um, she came into and amassed what was the largest collection of incarceration camp art in private hands. And the bulk of it was bequeathed to her from um, Mabel Rose Jameson, who had been the art teacher at the Roar Camp. And when the camp closed and Miss Jameson left, she took all her students' art with her in these big trunks. 
Some of it she donated to uh, the Japanese American National Museum in uh, Los Angeles. Some of it went to the Smithsonian. But she kept her favorite pieces for herself. And when she died, she willed them to Rosalie Gould. So when people found out Rosalie had this collection, that it further increased people wanting to come visit her. And furthermore, when they would come, if these were people who had been at camp, Frequently, they would bring her their own family art, their own family treasures, and the collection grew and grew and grew. So I thought this was a really interesting story, and I wanted to pursue this and figure out what it was about Rosalie that <laughs> made people travel all the way across the country just to see her, to give her something. And that was what the film originally was about. And so I had this plan that I was going to interview people who'd been coming for decades to see her. Well, the problem was they all died. You know, people who were adults in the camp have started to die at alarming rates now. Um, so I wasn't really able to tell that story, but what I found were different stories. And so the film has, has grown from being about the art. It's still very, very much about the art. That is central to the film. But it's, it's a present-day story about what was the effect of incarceration on the ger generation that was born after camp closed? Because that was profound, and I had never heard that story. And it's also um, a story about civil rights and self-identity. We do discuss the um, the Yada family. They're they're central to the story, to the film. Um, we talk about what it was like growing up Japanese American in a world where there were only two choices: you were either black or you were white. And every single facet of your life was determined by which some of them you were. So it's going to be a very, very good film, I hope. I think it's going to really engage people and get them thinking. And we're going to continue to talk about it in just a moment, provided you have the time, because we are out of time for this over-the-air version of our conversation. So if you would care to, and we hope you will, join us on the web. We're going to continue our conversation with Vivian Schiffer. Camp 9 is the book and uh, the cinema soon to follow. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.